I was born in 1929 in a small farming community downstate Illinois. The town had a population of about 2,900. My father was a physician, an osteopathic physician. You may wonder why he was an osteopathic physician instead of a medical doctor. But if you think back in the 1920s when he went to school, uh, medicine was a far different thing than it is now. There were very few specific items of therapy, quinine for malaria. Uh, antibiotics were unknown. Uh, and there didn't seem to be very much difference in a small community as to what he could do as an osteopathic physician. And I think there are probably economic reasons that he chose to to go that, that way. Um, things were quite different in those days. Um, the first house, the house where I was born, I was born at home, uh, we moved from that small house to a house bigger in 1936. I think the house was probably purchased by paying unpaid taxes because this was in the middle of the Depression. And the moving equipment was a mule-drawn wagon. I can remember being frightened when I the mule started up and I sort of was riding the wagon, but uh, anyway, we made it. Um, there was not much to do in the small town. Uh, I got interested in the Boy Scouts, and the, this was something that was new, uh, established in the town. And a friendly competition sort of grew up among the boys my age, and I very much value that experience. Uh, the, the scouting, while it has many disadvantages, it has many advantages. It's got a 12 laws that I can't remember anymore. But be prepared, well, that's good advice for, for life in general. And there was sort of a friendly competition that grew up among the, the boys in, the, in this town. I remember vividly uh, going to upper Wisconsin for canoe trips in the summer, going to camp. Uh, we competed for merit badges, and I ended up with an Eagle Award and three palms, whatever that is. Uh, I got interested in, in science at, in, uh, in high school. Actually, I got interested in grade school because when we were going through the, some of the packing cases in the basement, I came across a chemistry book that my father had used when he was in college. And this made fascinating reading. And uh, so I got interested. <clears throat> I finally, uh, and, and there was a good science teacher. Uh, she was kind of strict, but uh, also understood how people learned, and so I was encouraged in school. Uh, there was a prize at that time, the Westinghouse, the company, had a science talent search for high, in high school students. And I won an honorable mention for a description of how I would construct a jet engine airplane, which was had just begun to be heard of. <clears throat> uh, I went to Monmouth College. Uh, that was where both of my parents went. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I really even thought about going any, any place else. Uh, Monmouth was a United Presbyterian school. It was kind of ultra-conservative, ultra but the chemistry department uh, was noted for the fact that it had sent more PhD degree recipients to the University of Illinois, I mean, more students who ended up with PhDs there than any other school in the country. So there was a strong emphasis of science. My father would 
have preferred that I follow in his footsteps and come back and take over the practice uh, in the town. But he wanted me to be uh, have advantages that he no longer had because of advances in medicine that he, had because of his previous training, was sort of denied to him. So uh, he wanted me to go to medical school first and then go to osteopathic school and then come back. In order to do that, I've sort of thought, well, maybe I better get through medical school as quickly as possible. So the summer I graduated from high school, I spent six weeks at Western Illinois University in Macomb, Illinois, taking college courses. And the next two summers I spent at Bradley University in Peoria taking chemistry courses, uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis and organic chemistry and I'm not sure what else. So I finished three college academic years in two calendar years. And there were a few schools uh, at that time that would accept medical school applicants after three years of college. So I applied to Loyola University, to University of Chicago. I'm not sure there were four schools. Uh, and I was accepted first at Loyola. Uh, this was shortly before Christmas, or yeah, shortly before Christmas. And uh, I wrote to the University of Chicago because uh, at that time I didn't know much about either place, but it seemed pretty clear to me that University of Chicago was a, probably a better school. So I called the University of Chicago and asked if I told them that I had been accepted at another medical school. I would rather come to Chicago. Is there any chance that I could have an my application evaluated early. So he came up for an interview and I don't remember how it went, but <clears throat> this was at a time when Loyola was over by Cook County Hospital and it was the old Cook County Hospital, not the fancy Strozier Hospital it is now. And it was a snowy, stormy day in Chicago and that part of the city didn't seem so attractive and I arrived at the University of Chicago campus and here was these gothic structures and I was impressed by the place. And a week or so later I got an acceptance. So I came to the University of Chicago. And uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do as far as medical school is concerned or what medical practice. I'd already gotten interested in science uh, and my old professor at Monmouth participated in a course in, under, in uh, biological sciences, marine bi biology at Woods Hole, in, at Woods Hole at the Marine bi Biological Institute there. So he participated in teaching of the course and would take two students along to sort of do, if we wanted research, we could attend some of the classes and it seemed like a good way to spend six weeks in the summer. So I got involved in, in doing research there. Uh, he had been interested in tapeworms in mice for some reason. Hymenolopus nana. And it has an interesting life history. It has to, the eggs have to be eaten by beetles. The larvae develop, then the mice eat the larvae and the larvae mature into worms. But how the eggs got hatched in the, in the beetles was not known. So we spent five of those six weeks trying to figure that out, You're trying enzymes, trying this, trying that, trying the other. And then finally it dawned on me, these eggs are pretty big and the beetles are pretty small, maybe they chew them. And so I was able to take a pin and 
crack the egg, and lo and behold, the larvae swam out. And I think that we, just, we concluded that that was the way that the life cycle of the Hymenolopus and Nana were developed. So that success sort of helped me out. Now, in those days, the first two years of medical school were three quarters. We had the summer quarter off. And, and the first courses were sort of, it were biochemistry and physiology, and I've forgotten what all else. <clears throat> but they were mainly factual courses. You had to sort of just learn things. And then we got into pathology, which was disease. Well, this meant more to me than uh, merely remembering the Krebs cycle or any of that sort of stuff. But there was a unique person, Paul Cannon, was chairman of the Department of Pathology. I think he met with the class two times and other faculty then were responsible for teaching. And the first thing he said when he went into, met with a class, was uh, the invention of the printing press made the lecture obsolete. Uh, you can learn all the facts from the books. It's the really interesting thing is how the facts are arrived at, what are the limitations of those facts, and how do all these facts mix together to end up either health, disease, something. So the course was organized in three discussion sections. The class was split up into three units. And the faculty member met with each unit. And we had discussions. And we were thrown out questions. And uh, depending upon our responses, uh, each of the sessions ended up far different. The smarter ones in the class recognized that. So we would get together and pool notes from each of the classes. And we came to understand much more realistically, I think, what medicine, what science, what discovery is all about. And the labs were run the same way. Uh, the, we had a set of microscope slides and accompanying it was a book of containing histories of the patients from whom that tissue, that slide came. And we were supposed to figure out how what we saw caused symptoms, why the symptoms developed, and, and this was really quite exciting. Uh, also, uh, there was a museum of, which contained gross specimens, many of which were pretty gross in themselves. And we were encouraged, whenever there was an autopsy going on, to go see exactly how things were done. And the professor I ended up with, working as a student with, uh, a classmate of mine and I t saw the green light on over the museum door, and that meant there was an autopsy going on in the room below. So we quickly went down. And it turns out that the deaner, that is the hired help that was supposed to come in and assist uh, during the autopsy, uh, he somehow disappeared that day. So here was the professor alone with, and we entered introduced ourselves, he knew us already. And he said, well, do you want to participate? And this was as a second year medical student. And I said, sure. So we gowned up and he gave me things to do. I had never done them before, but it pretty obviously what should be done. And that just began a, a really a friendship uh, and an approach that, that I ended up following. 